Hello, I'm Elizabeth Lumley from Finextra, and today I'm speaking to Werner Steinmuller of Deutsche Bank. So we're speaking here today um, prior to EBA Day, which is in Berlin this year. Um, and, and the theme of, of this year's conference is uh, invites delegates to get ready for a borderless world for payments. Now, you know, in terms of we now have end dates for SEPA, uh, SEPA credit transfer, SEPA direct debit, but there are a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of people predicting variations, regional variations on how people are going to deal with SEPA. So, you know, with some of these differences in standards and, and how people are complying, you know, is this idea of a, a borderless world, you know, how much, how far away is that promise for that borderless world of payments? Yeah, we have already for borderless <laughs> payments because SEPA exists. The acceptance in Europe is around about 7% of all payments are rooted already through SEPA. But the idea is to eliminate all these local payment schemes, over 30 in Europe, to have to one payment platform. The strong advantage from SEPA is Europe has one currency and one payment platform. Efficiency, cost savings, consumer benefits, and remember the good old days where we could charge very nice fees for cross-border transactions. They are all over. All transactions are domestic. doesn't matter going forward if you have your account here in Germany, Paris, or any other European city. A big advantage going forward. What role, though, I mean, uh, we, I know that we have end dates for SEPA, and, uh, but a lot of people I've been speaking to are saying this isn't an end date, this is now the start of SEPA compliance and SEPA migration. So what role do banks play in ensuring that their clients can deal with this transition phase and that they can cope with SEPA migration? Deutsche Bank, and here we are aligned uh, with the European Central Bank and the local regulators want to have a final end date. And anyone is switching on February 1st to SEPA. And this is, by the way, the law. It's mm -hmm. not recommended. Yes, I know some countries have already some exceptions where they can take a parallel system available. I mean, up to two years. They can up to, to two, two years, years, but it's only a handful of countries. Mm -hmm. But the key countries, like Germany, are February 1st. And the more and better the corporates are prepared, the better are the results. I assume all banks have done the homework, and I think this is very important. But it's much more important we speak actively with our clients and not speaking about the multinational, the large cap, I'm really speaking in the mid cap and SME segment. Mm. You know, the butcher, the really SME shops also prepared for SEPA standards. The good thing about it, the regulators are supporting us. For example, Deutsche Bundesbank is talking to auditors and tax advisors to tell their clients and make them ready for SEPA. And as we also have to talk much more through the press, and I think this is very important. We shouldn't just send letters out, because this is not a good example, because many, how many letters you receive about from banks, do you all read it? Yes. Not. But this is active involvement by relationship, by the bank, in order to make the clients aware, because the law is saying 1st of February with a few countries with a much more extension. And also in this respect, we shouldn't rely on so-called interim solution. What I mean with this conversion of the old standard into the new standard using converters. The converters have a high risk. Now just remember, when we changed the unification the payment system from East Germany to the payment system of West Germany. And over a sudden, we had such a high return rate because direct debits failed to be executed that it took later on two years to fix it. Please remember this example. So make it not through conversion, but every time you convert messages, mm -hmm. messages can get lost. And when you don't have all of the details, it cannot be reconciled in your accounting. And so you have issues. So there's a strong message for me, get it right, do it the first time right.
and don't rely on so-called uh, solutions which are only interim solutions. Mm. But isn't that you mentioned, you know, paying more attention to SMEs and smaller corporates? Isn't is aren't they more liable to rely on uh, converter solutions? No, for law is saying sorry, mm. converter is not anymore allowed. <laughs> make it very straight and and this is our job together with a regulator mm. to inform them and tell them what are the consequences and help them to have less uh, returns specifically on the direct debit side. Mm. So you know I think this leads into another again what I mentioned uh, you know the banker's favorite topic uh, global regulations and of course the onslaught of global regulations. So you know right now we you know banks are looking at you mentioned Basel 3 Dodd-Frank, we have FACTA coming out uh, of the U.S. You know, how, how are banks dealing with all these variations of global ra regulations right You have no right choice. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to be in business, you mm -hmm. have to follow. Regulations is law, a law you have to follow. If you like it or don't like it, if a law passed the legislation, you have to execute. What my recommendation is, reduce the amount of changes and the timing of the changes. We are spending close to 50% of all of our investment budget in IT just to scope with regulations. I recently attended a conference from the European Central Bank talking about platforms and regulations. And one central banker asked the question, when do we start the deregulation? And then he asked the next question, saying, what will happen if some of other countries are taking deregulation as an advantage to get more financial business in certain countries. I think this is a very fair question. Mm -hmm. And I think the regulator also should, because be careful, if you over-regulate, I cannot explain you all of the regulations. And this is already, it's too many. And this should be really brought down. And we need a break. Install it, need a break, and if more regulations are then really needed, fine, but have a break. I'm going to move on. I'm going to ask you a, a bit more of a theoretical question now. I mean, the past few years have been mentioned by uh, many people as sort of this grand time for transaction banking um, uh, in, in the banking world. And, and a lot of banks are taking variant approaches on how to organize the transaction bank, you know, changing operating models or trying to become more flexible uh, with their clients. I mean, is there, is there a right one way to do transaction banking today? I would be a genius if I would tell you the right way. I'm always looking and now running close to 10 years my job looking for the right way. Um, it depends how you're structured. Do you have investment banking? Are you more a commercial bank? What is your client base? Is it SME? Is it mid-cap? Is it multinationals? So there's a variety of structures. Are you more wholesale banking? Are you more retail banking? All these things play, are you global, are you regional, are you local? So all these things play a role with the right model. Mm. I see a certain trend that cash management corporates and trade finance is more aligned to the corporate and commercial side. I see securities world, FI cash managers more to the investment bank, some of the competitor organized in this way. Mm -hmm. I still believe our model is right. Uh, we have in Deutsche Bank have one transaction bank combining all of the transaction banking services from the cash management, both corporate financial institutions, trade finance, trust and security services. And I think this is very important to find the right model, adjusting to it. And one big advantage I am seeing is the synergies, because all the securities need products like cash management. They need current accounts. So there's a lot of synergies and everything is flow driven. And so I see a lot of advantages to have one unit who is considered, in my opinion, one of the most stable businesses, even more stable than retail banking, to have it separated. Mm -hmm. External reporting. Some think external reporting is good enough. No, externally, internally has to be al aligned to bring the right message to the market. But this is any firm has to create, depending on the business model, the right structure. This is where I believe is the right structure. So far, very successful. We've proven really to have a very nice track record with this strategy. And as, as long as I'm outperforming the market, I will not change.
So you mentioned you mentioned earlier about trying you know trying to look to see how international you are as a bank or you know how you can serve uh, the local markets. You know, looking at Deutsche Bank, which has such a large footprint in Europe, um, but of course also has ambitions in, in in other areas around the globe and dealing with the emerging uh, the emerging markets. How do you how do you balance sort of taking care of your domestic clients with exploring uh, the changing market in uh, South America and Asia, for example? What I see is these days, one of the advantages we are having, we have a huge international network, not only in Western Europe. We also have it in Asia, and we are very strong in North America, with some also presence in Latin America. So it is also these days very important to have a mixed portfolio from a diversification. Americas with a new development and the positive things of the US economy, we are benefiting from it. Asia, the growth market, we see also challenges here coming ahead. In the past, anyone invested to Asia, the competition is much higher. So you have a diverse portfolio. We are extremely well positioned in Europe and we are benefiting from the issues we have in Southern Europe because it's fly to quality. So having a mixed portfolio for me is extremely important to be successful. Combining with our strategy we have in Germany and in the Netherlands with our mid-cap space is idea. Because companies already in the smaller area of 10 million revenues, specifically if an export-driven nation like Germany need cross-border transaction. They have foreign exchange exposure. So they need a partner to be really in the mid-cap, to be locally very strong and opening for international network. So we have it. And this is one of a competitive advantage for all in the whole market in Germany as well as in the Netherlands. I'm going to um, finish off our conversation with, uh, with a topic that I, I, I've spoken to a number of people about in, in all areas of, of banking, from you know, retail banking, transaction banking, basically any, any part of, of the bank that deals with, with customers. And this is this um, idea that there's a real threat that many of bank services will be commoditized. Um, and so there's banks are looking around to see how they're going to um, add value and, and you know, differentiate themselves from competitors. So where is, uh, where is the threat of commoditization for transaction banks and, and where is the value add? You know, I'm starting with a Chinese symbol. <laughs> Risk and chance is the same. So with these regulations or standardization, you are changing also the markets. SEPA, why should you recommend SEPA? Because you make less money for it. But it is a standardization, higher volumes, but it's an opportunity if you are IT driven, if you are prepared to make the investment, to gain market shares. Not anyone is prepared to make this high investment to gain. So any of these standardization is helping also for certain consolidation between the industry, because investments are very high, to have uh, European or worldwide solutions in order to position yourself. So I think, and this is my opinion, the more and more we have this industrialization, the larger transaction banking and for transaction banking and or specializing on certain topics are benefiting of it, higher volume. And as you know, if you are straight through processing, then it's very good to have high volumes and any additional revenues is, uh, is basically making you more money. And I think this is one of the things I'm not afraid, mm -hmm. specifically if you are coming with a high tech provider and solutions provider in the industry. Thank you very much, Werner. Thank you very much. And thank you all for watching.